Um, same as last time, we're going to use the chat box throughout this session. So you can see I've already written in there. Um, but same thing as normal. If you've got any questions, you can type them up in there. I wouldn't mind everyone saying hello. I've got Mia. Hi, Mia. Hi, Caitlin. You said hello. I said hi to Taryn. Hi, Taryn. Um, and same as last time too, we might put our microphones um, on mute while we've got our beautiful guest presenters um, talking to us. And then we'll open it up for questions at the end as well. Tiana, anything you want to mention before we hand it over? No, welcome. Thanks for joining us so early, as always. <laughs> on this cold Saturday lockdown morning. <laughs> Good times. Now, we are really lucky today, guys. Um, we've actually got four guest presenters, two of which are with us now, and two will be in the second session after we have our little break. Um, so we are joined uh, by everyone here from the ANCS, which is the Australian Marine Conservation Society. Um, and we've been really lucky to line up some very special talks uh, today. So you might see Leo over here. Um, Leo's going to be joining us to talk about see a shark. Yeah? Yeah, sharks Am I right, correct? Yeah. Yes, about sharks and rays very soon, but we're going to start um, with a very special guest presenter down below me on my screen is David from the AMCS and David works with the Great Barrier Reef. Am I correct? That is correct. So we're going to hear a little bit from both of these guys and then we'll open it up for questions um, at the end of that. So sit back, relax, David, you have the floor. I'm excited to hear everything that's going on. Right, well, I'm going to share my screen to get into my presentation. Can everyone see Fight for Our Reef on their screen now? I can. Wonderful. <clears throat> so, um, to get us started, um, I just want to thank everyone for being here. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered all across the country. Um, we're gathered on Aboriginal land, you know, um, the land was never ceded. And um, I pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. The people in my area in Brisbane are the Yagger and Turrbal people. Um, and I also want to particularly think about the um, uh, traditional owners of the uh, sea country of the Great Barrier Reef. So Aboriginal people have been, um, you know, looking after and fishing the Great Barrier Reef for many thousands of years in a really sustainable way. And so I think we have a lot to learn um, from traditional owners of Australia about how we can, you know, better manage and look after our beautiful places. Um, so before we kind of get started with my presentation, I'm basically going to tell you a bit about myself and how I got to be in this position. Um, let you know about all the kind of the threats facing our beautiful Great Barrier Reef and then kind of what we do at the AMCS to try and protect it and what you can do in your lives to help as well. And so, um, you know, when, when you think about fighting for the reef, like what, you know, what the biggest threat for the reef is, like what comes to mind? Like, do you want to just like put in the chat, like what do you think the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef is? And I'll let you know whether you're correct or not. <laughs> um, do I see the chat on here? I think I do. I'll wait for a few things. Oh, Caitlin's got it in one. Climate change, nailed it. Um, so yeah, and so I think a lot of people who aren't as, uh, you know, cl clued on as you guys clearly are, think that many other things are threats to the Great Barrier Reef that aren't as big as this one. And I think, um, so therefore, you know, in campaigning to protect the Great Barrier Reef, we're essentially campaigning to fix climate change, which is a big issue, uh, but one that I'm super passionate about and have been campaigning on for a number of years now as both a volunteer and now as a kind of paid campaigner. So I'm really excited to show you a bit of my journey and what we do in this space. Um, to get us started, some real basic climate science that I'm sure you're already aware of, but I just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. You know, what are we talking about when we're talking about climate change? We're talking about um, heat, uh, being trapped in our atmosphere, which is normal, which makes us a habitable planet, which provides all the life on Earth that we love. Um, but we're putting out uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, etc., that's making a bigger, thicker blend around the world and heating us up to a point where temperatures are now raised at least one degree above in pre-industrial standards, which is really crazy. Um, so, and of course, this... Um, map this graph shows that increase in um, CO2 is perfectly aligned with increases in temperature. Um, I hit some sort of captioning thing. I don't know if you're seeing this on my screen as a real screen as well. Um, but anyway, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, and so AMCS has been on the forefront of uh, protecting the Great Barrier Reef for over 50 years. Um, our first big campaign was around 
um, saving the Barrier Reef from what was then the threat to the reef was they wanted to mine for limestone. They wanted to literally dig up big chunks of coral to be used um, in various industrial processes. Um, and then they wanted to drill for oil. Um, and this was all before it was a marine park. And so we were, um, you know, uh, fighting to protect it in that, in that sense. And we were able to get it, you know, marine, uh, into, protected into a marine park and also, um, you know, giving it world heritage status, which is really cool. Um, and so my kind of journey with uh, fighting for the Great Barrier Reef started um, a few years ago now when I first saw this map. And so for those who may not have been to Queensland, this is part of central Queensland. Um, you've got the Great Barrier Reef in the dark blue, and then you've got this huge Galilee Basin in the left corner. So that's where um, there's at the time, there were nine mega mines proposed of coal, and then all these uh, coal ports that you can see along the Great Barrier Reef, uh, where they wanted to uh, dredge the sea floor and then dump millions of tons of the sea floor back into the marine park. And it would all be fine, and we'd be able to protect the reef while also exporting a huge amount of carbon dioxide at the same time. And I first saw this map <clears throat> when I was. Uh, quite young. I was at university. I don't know if you can see me in this photo. I was at a youth climate um, summit organized by the Australian Youth Climate Coalition and they're headquartered in Melbourne. So if you haven't heard them, check them out. They were really um, pivotal part for me in being where I am today. Um, and when I saw this map, I just couldn't believe that, um, you know, this was happening. Like I grew up in Cairns on the Great Barrier Reef, which is even further north on this map. Um, and, you know, went out to the reef with my family growing up and, you know, kind of took for granted how beautiful and pristine this place was and just thought that our leaders would be acting in the best interests of this place that was so important for like local industry. Like, you know, the tourism industry is really huge in Cairns because everyone wants to come and see the reef. And then when I got um, to university and was learning more about um, the, uh, how our politicians were like dropping the ball on climate change and then proposing not only not to reduce emissions like we should be doing, but increase emissions through exporting all this new coal. I was just frustrated, mad, and just knew I had to do something about it. And so um, I immediately joined my local um, youth climate group um, at my university and got active talking to my peers and uh, you know, getting people to sign petitions, getting um, active on ca the campaign to try and stop this development. At the time, it was all about the coal ports, trying to stop the coal ports. Um, and uh, it was really successful. So um, we did a bunch of actions um, in talking to the banks. So like we had rallies like this one that I was at, um, that was a kind of collaboration with AMCS and AYCC and other groups. Um, and we also spoke a lot to bank staff. So we would go into bank offices and say, hi, did you know that your bank um, might be funding uh, a coal port on the Great Barrier Reef and they'd be dumping the dredge floor in the Marine Park, all that sort of stuff. And um, it was really successful. And we were able to get all the banks to pull out and not fund the coal ports. And eventually we were able to get the Queensland government uh, to basically put a ban on the dumping of dredge floor into the Marine Park, which was a huge win. And we were able to stop all of those new coal ports on the reef. So now there's no plans for expansion of coal ports. And if they, if anyone wants to dredge in um, the Great Barrier Reef, they have to put the dredge ball on land. They can't dump it out in the water. So that's it was a huge win for conservation. And so this photo was from Airy Beach, which is right near um, uh, the Whit Sundays, right near one of the proposed port developments. Um, where my former colleague uh, Cherry did a really good job of bringing together traditional owners, businesses, community members uh, to oppose the expansion, the in inappropriate expansion right next to this beautiful place. And um, yeah, it's been really inspiring. So then that was in 2015, and that was just before we saw the world's worst coral bleaching event ever. This was in 2016, and we saw corals all around the world um, react really visibly to the impacts of climate change. So, you know, we saw corals go from healthy to bleached to dead all around the world and our reef was not, um, you know, didn't escape that. And so when I first started with AMCS in 2017, as a staff member, we saw this is what we were dealing with. We were dealing with a heat wave around the world that caused severe coral bleaching um, in the north, far northern section in 2016 and then the central section in 2017. 
and all up, we saw 50% of the shallow water corals die in two years, which was, um, you know, devastating to say the least and a real wake up call for everyone that, you know, this big, beautiful place isn't forever if we don't take seriously the threat of climate change and, you know, rapidly reduce emissions, go to renewable energy and, you know, do everything we can to look after this place. And there was a lot of really good science that came out of the time that showed in really stark terms what we were dealing with. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are now seeing this level of coral bleaching at one degree of warming. And the, uh, you know, the consensus of scientists, so kind of like the very lowest co common denominator of what coral reef scientists and climate scientists are saying is that if we uh, increase by another 0.5 of a degree, we're gonna lose 70% of the world's coral reefs. And if we get to two degrees of warming, we're almost gonna, we're gonna lose nearly all coral reefs in the world, which is a very frightening statistic um, that I think causes a lot of us to act really, like want to act even more. And so it's really clear that to have, the, our, for our reef to have the best chance for the future, we must limit global warming to 1.5 degrees or lower. Um, and we've got to assume that in that 70% range, our reef being so big and well ma managed in general terms, that you'd think parts of our reef would be uh, the best parts of that seven of the thirty percent that remain. Um, so yeah, frightening stuff. And then of course, if twenty twenty wasn't bad enough on fronts, we had another coral bleaching event in twenty twenty. And so as you can see on the right now, um, this is the kind of map that we've seen. And so uh, you know the people who do this go up in an, uh, a, a plane and fly over coral reefs across the length and breadth of the Great Barrier Reef and take notes on how what bleaching they've seen. And so this is only bleaching; it doesn't show mortality, which is a different concept, obviously, and one that you need to be in the water to. And so in 2020, we saw it was the most widespread coral bleaching event in the sense that they saw widespread bleaching from all the way up to the top, all the way to the bottom, which as you've seen on the left and the, on the other two panels, it had been more isolated. Whereas this one, it was really, um, really nowhere was spared. Except of course, this huge bit on the outer reef in the north um, and in the south as well. And so that means that a lot of the um, prime tourist sites out of Cairns and Port Douglas didn't get bleaching this year, which was really great news because um, they were already seeing corals kind of uh, start to regenerate from 2016 and 2017. And um, fortunately they didn't see as bad bleaching, but obviously this isn't, isn't any good news. Um, and scientists now, now that uh, restrictions are easing with COVID, hopefully they'll be able to get back in the water and check out what's going on in terms of mortality. Cause we're not really sure, you know, the extent of that. Um, there are some anecdotal uh, reports from certain places that the, um, because coral bleaching is all based on heat, that there was a sudden drop in temperatures towards the end of the bleaching um, season, as we're now calling it, and that um, the microorganisms within the algae that were expelled because of the heat would have been able to get back in into the coral due to the drop in temperatures. So we're hoping that that um, happened a lot of the places, but you know, it's too early to tell. And so then if we're talking about this global issue of climate change, you know, what do we do about it? What's Australia's contribution? Um, so obviously on the left, I'm seeing the global greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide caused by fossil fuels is by far the biggest contributor. And so that's the burning of coal, gas, oil. And Australia is responsible for 5% of that whole chunk, um, which is pretty incredible given how small a population we are. And so this includes that export. So there's coal, uh, the coal and gas that's going out through the Great Barrier Reef already. Um, there are already coal ports there. Um, you know, that's a huge part of that. And so there was a recent study that showed that um, our exported emissions are greater than the domestic emissions of Germany, Canada, Turkey, and the UK combined, which is pretty mind boggling. And if, and then there was another study that showed that our contribution to climate change could be up to 17% by 2030, because our policies don't currently don't show us reducing our emissions, whereas other countries are reducing their emissions. So we have a whole lot of work to do. And so what does that mean for us? We're building the movement of people who care about these issues and are taking action to keep coal and gas in the ground and move to renewable energy. And you may have heard of the Stop the Dining Movement, um, and we're part of that, trying to keep that one of those, one of those mega coal mines that would unlock the whole Galilee Basin, we need to keep that in the ground. We're working with the tourism industry. So 
before I moved to Brisbane with AMCS, I was based in Cairns and I was on the ground working with locals who are really passionate about the reef and want to protect it, especially in the tourism industry. So on the right, that's me with a reef climate declaration with um, Cole McKenzie, the CEO of the Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators. We got them to sign on to a big, bold climate declaration, which was exciting, made a lot of news. And then on the left, there's people that work in the dive industry who organise this kind of fun protest after work um, to show, um, you know, the world that they're really part of this push to get coral, not coal. Um, you know, we're stopping the money going to these projects. Um, this, you know, Westpac we've been campaigning on for ages and uh, a few, couple of years ago, they made a promise not to invest in any new coal basins, which rules out funding for the Galilee Basin and Adani, which is really exciting. We've been able to stop public money to Adani and um, these coal ports as well. So this is me in Cairns campaigning in the electorate of then treasurer at the state level, Curtis Pitt. Um, he was in charge of saying yes or no to a billion dollar loan from the federal government that would go to Adani. And we were able to push the government to do the right thing and not to give the money, which was really awesome. And yeah, and we won, which was really fun. And then we've done work around a federal election. So again, in Cairns, we were there to, um, you know, uh, talk with uh, the then opposition leader, Bill Shorten, this is a volunteer, Beck, um, who got to speak with him. We were there when various politicians came to town to send a really clear message about what we wanted for our reef. Um, and we talked to voters at, um, on doors. We had our kind of scorecards that you can see there that compared the different parties' policies when it came to protecting the Great Barrier Reef. And then this is election night, which was very mixed emotions, because um, we, of course, saw a government re-elected that doesn't have strong policies to protect the Great Barrier Reef, so that was pretty disappointing. Um, but we can be really proud of our efforts and we were able to, um, you know, make the reef a really big issue to the point where our local MP who was re-elected, um, he made a really like big effort to show that, to, to maybe pretend to be really pro-environment more than he is. Um, so it goes to show like that people really know that this is a big issue for people. And so kind of moving ahead in terms of trying to keep coal in the ground, um, and get to renewable energy. We're kind of continuing to be, build a strong, diverse movement. We're delaying the Adani coal mine, which is that big first mover in the Galilee Basin until the cost benefit analysis means they have to walk away. Um, we're building the political space for strong action, including new, new coal. So that's, you know, um, getting, you know, politicians to go ahead with all those big renewable projects, which we love. And so obviously this has been a lot of bad news. So I wanted to kind of have some good news in here. Um, that you know renewable energy is really taking off it's the cheapest form of uh power around the world and other countries are doing really good things like for example the uk which started the industrial revolution that got us starting to burn coal in the first place they're going to completely phase out coal by 2025 which is pretty exciting and other you know even parts of china and the us which are those you know big polluters that we kind of think oh they're not doing anything they're actually like the sub states of them are actually doing good stuff which is exciting and here in Australia, that's kind of happening as well, where the state level people are doing some good things, where like South Australia is on track for 100% renewable energy by 2030. The ACT and Tasmania are basically already there right now. And um, as a whole, all of the different targets for different states and territories, they're all the same, which is to get to zero net emissions by 2050, which is the right goal. But the fact is that with that federal government policy, um, it's just kind of chaotic and we really need that policy certainty to be able to get um, moving on renewable energy. Um, and there's the thought that, you know, you know, we're, our, currently our emissions are rising, our exports are continuing to increase, um, but it doesn't have to be this way. We can in fact, um, you know, get to 100% domestic renewable energy here in Australia. Um, and then we can also export renewable energy. So there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in that space where people, where there's plans to have a, a, a literal line of energy from the Northern Territory to Singapore. Um, where you can just like directly export solar um, or you can kind of uh, use renewable energy to create hydrogen gas, which you can then export kind of like gas in Australia uh, to countries like South Korea and Japan that currently accepts our fossil fuels. And um, yeah, so there's definitely ways that we can like replace the sturdy polluting uh, industry of the past with the clean um, energy of the future. So that's what we're really pushing for. And of course, you know, climate change isn't the only threat to the Great Barrier Reef. This photo was from a big flood last year where, um, you know, poorly 
looked after farms, uh, can leach a whole bunch of sediment and uh, uh, fertilizers that get washed out to sea and smother the great corals, which can, is obviously not great. Um, and so we are doing a lot of work on this effort as well. And so we've been able to push the state government here in Queensland to pass regulations that would mean that farmers have to um, comply with minimum standards so that this sort of thing doesn't happen in the future, which is exciting. Um, of course, other threats like the crown of thorn starfish outbreak that eat coral and there's some various programs happening around that. Um, overfishing is a big issue in the reef and Leo might touch on that a bit later. Um, uh, you know, a different team at AMCF, our fisheries uh, team work really hard to improve um, all those laws so that we don't overfish um, and then, you know, screw up the ecosystem from that angle. And so, yeah, no, it's not too late to save the reef. We're, it's going to be a really big battle to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees and give our reef the best chance for the future. But, you know, with people like yourselves who really care about these things, um, I really have hope, um, especially, um, you know, the recent uh, school strike for climate movement around the world has just been incredible to be a part of. Um, this was in Cairns uh, and I was kind of helping out the school strike organisers. And so I think uh, it's really kind of waking us, waking many people up to say that, you know, this is just a non-negotiable issue. Um, it's going to affect all of our lives. And coral reefs are just the canary in the coal mine for climate change. It's going to have a whole lot of other disastrous impacts uh, if we don't sort it out. And so what you can do, I would say, you know, come visit the reef when you can. Obviously right now, Victoria's not in that space, but you know, when it all kind of lifts, come visit because it's still beautiful. And I think it'll uh, make you um, even more, be more passionate to protect it after that. And just really get active on climate change. And so when I first started getting active, I thought that meant like, you know, conserving energy at home, turning off lights and everything. And then once I realized that <laughs> our personal um, impacts are nowhere near what's needed to save the world, I kind of more focus on, you know, the big companies and the governments that have the power to change things. You know, there's that stat around 70% um, uh, of the world's carbon emissions are from a hundred companies. So like, you know, it's like, we're not to blame for climate change. It's uh, big polluting industries that aren't regulated properly from government. So we need to use our democratic voice. We need to talk to our friends. We need to organize events, organize our friends um, to get active on climate change. And there are groups all around the place that are there to help you do that. And one of them is ours, which is, and if you go to the Fight for Our Reef website, there's a whole lot of tools that can help you with um, how to have conversations about climate change and um, you know, talk to your local MPs and let them know what you think. Even if you can't vote, they need to be representing you. And um, yeah, I'd really encourage you to get in touch with your MPs um, as, as, as you can, especially when people are, um, you know, distracted with COVID, they like to, it's like a nice excuse not to have to talk about these difficult issues. But, you know, this climate change is going to continue long after the pandemic and we need to get active on it now. So, yeah, that's me. Thank you so much for um, my time and I'll hand over to Leo.